Hello and welcome to Safe Pasture. My name is Sherry Hammers and we are continuing in the book The Holiest of All. We are now today on chapter 29 called The Rest of Faith. If you remember last time we were talking about the rest in Canaan and talking about how people uh, that come out of Egypt they might go through and come out of Egypt, but if they're not willing to go into the promised land and do the warfare, then they are in trouble. And we're going to continue on that teaching, but we're going to focus today on the rest of faith. And Andrew Murray starts out with Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And he begins his chapter, uh, after that scripture, he says, The aim of the writer in this whole section is to warn us not to rest content with the former, the preparatory stage, but to show all diligence to reach the second and enter the promised rest of complete deliverance. Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest, any of you should come short of it. Some think that the rest of Canaan is the type of heaven. And in the last video, we talked about how Crossing over the Jordan and going into Canaan is not a type of heaven. That is not heaven. And Andrew goes on to say, This cannot be because the great mark of the Canaan life was that the land had to be conquered. And that gave God such glorious victory. And so it is in the life of faith when a soul learns to trust God for victory over sin and yields itself entirely as to its circumstances and duties to live just where and how he wills, talking about God, that it enters the rest. It lives in the promise, in the will, in the power of God. This is the rest into which it enters, not through death, but through faith, or rather not through the death of the body, but the death to self in the death of Christ through faith. Now that's a, that's a mouthful, but he's talking here about the person that will live the life of faith that pleases God, is that you trust God for victory. I'm kind of looking back here. You trust God for victory over sin. You yield yourself entirely as to its circumstances and duties to live just where and how he wills. In other words, even in your everyday life, you're going to yield yourself to live where God has you live, to do what God has you to do, that you're going to be fulfilling his will. He says that when you do that, you're going to enter the rest of God. And so that's when you live in the promise, in the will, in the power of God. And there is a rest to that because when you are being obedient to God, when you do everything, what is that one scripture I'm trying to think of right now where it talks about having done all to stand. So when we do everything that we know to do, we've sought God, we've done everything that he has shown us to do up to that point, then we can just stand. And we can know that God's got our back, that he's going to take up for us. You know, God does not expect us to just uh, go out in faith and, and just to do all of these things in our own power. He never does. And there's a point where God, he, he has you obey. He has you go out and do what he says. And then he takes that place of obedience and he just does like Paul says in Ephesians 6, is exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. So when you're letting God's power work through you, then you can just rest that God's got it. He's got everything under control. Even if everything around you is spinning out of control, you can know that when you have obeyed God, there is rest in that. All right, let me see where I was. Okay, this is the rest into which it enters, not through death, but through faith, or rather not through the death of the body, but the death to self in the death of Christ through faith. So in other words, he's saying, you're going to have to enter into this rest through a death. Now we all know that, you know, 
when a person, when your body dies, you know, we have that saying, rest in peace, right? We know that the body, once the body dies, it's not laboring anymore, but it's at rest. The body is at rest. And he's saying to enter into the rest in this life, in this life of walking, walking with God, God's spirit ruling in our hearts, we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to that selfish nature, you know, that sinful nature. You know, when Jesus said, if anyone, if any man wants to follow me, he must what? Deny himself. The self is the first thing that has to go. It has to get out of the way of the Holy Spirit. If you remember, I think it's in Romans 8, but maybe we can put it up there. But the, the Spirit of God is at enmity against the spirit of the flesh. I mean, they are at war with each other. So if you've got a lot of flesh uh, ruling in your heart, your carnal nature, if, if that's who's in charge, the Holy Spirit is not going to be able to do much through you. But when you allow Him, you give way to Him, you let Him go first, not the flesh, you die to yourself, then the Holy Spirit can go before you and there is rest in that. Because you know that the, the, the God who created everything we can see, the God who's omniscient, all-powerful, omnipresent, when he's in charge of, of whatever it is that's happening in your life, when he's in charge and you've done everything you can, there's rest in that. There's rest in knowing that he's in control. And I mean, we come up short really quickly when we try to do things in our own strength. All right, so he says the land was waiting. In other words, the land of Canaan was, was waiting. It was waiting to be conquered. It was waiting to be possessed by God's people. The land was waiting. The rest was provided. Okay, so God's got everything laid out. He's got the land. He's got the rest. When they get over there and they obey, he's got the rest ready for them. It says God would bring them in and give them rest. One thing was lacking. They did not believe and so did not yield themselves to God to do it for them what he had promised. So see, if you're not yielded to God, the whole plan just goes kaplooey. I mean, it's just shot to pieces as far as you in that situation. I mean, God will get his will done through willing souls. But if you're not willing, he will, he will move on to someone else, which is not a pleasant thought that God's just like, okay, this has to happen. And if you're not willing to do it, I've got to find another person who's willing. You were my first choice, but now I've got to move on. And I'm, I'm thinking right now about, you know, King Saul. It appears through scripture, I could be wrong, but it appears through scripture that Saul was God's choice because God told Samuel, I will, I will show you which of Jesse's sons that I want because Israel asked for a king, which was not God's perfect will. But God said, all right, they want a king. I'll give them a king. And here's the one I want you to anoint, Samuel. So Samuel anointed Saul. Well, Saul did not yield himself. And what happened? He was killed in battle. And David, and Saul even knew in his lifetime that David would be the one who would be taking his place as king over Israel. So anyway, he says the, the thing that was lacking was unbelief. Saul was unbelieving. So he did not yield himself to do for him what he had promised just that's a just a bible example another thing andrew says here is unbelief closes the heart against god withdraws the life from god's power wow remember we talked last time when you look in i think it's revelation oh we'll put it up there it might be revelation 21 i'm not sure but it, it talks about the list of of the characteristics of people that will be thrown into the lake of burning fire and uh, it was the fearful and then the unbelieving so this is a serious thing it closes your heart against God when you refuse to believe God God can't do anything in your situation it may be a life and death situation and you're so full of fear and unbelief that you can't you you can't allow God to even move Remember J. Iris' daughter? Remember he came to Jesus and asked him to heal his daughter? He said, she's, she's at the point of death. And then the woman with the issue of blood came up. And 
she was asking Jesus, or she came and touched the hem of his garment, and Jesus turned around and had to, he dealt with that situation. And then they, there were some servants from Jairus' house that came and said, why trouble the master any longer? Your daughter is dead. And Jesus turned to Jairus, and what did he say? He said, uh, he said, do not be afraid, only believe. So Jesus there was covering the two things, the two big, the big uh, weapons that would have kept Jairus from the blessing of having his daughter raised from the dead. And that was fear and unbelief. And those are the very first two things that are listed for those who go into the lake of burning fire. I, that's, that, this is a warning worth heeding right here. And he says this, Unbelief closes the heart against God, withdraws the life from God's power. In the very nature of things, unbelief renders the word of promise of none effect. So you take, all of, you take God's beautiful promise. You know, it took, it took <laughs> literally an act of God to get these promises to a, a prophet who would listen, who would say them. Then, then God had these promises written down, and then it took all of this great effort to protect his word to this very time that we're living in. And your unbelief will just cancel it out. Isn't that sad? I think that's just tragic. So we've really got to watch how we're living our lives. You know, things matter. Words matter. Actions matter. Behavior matters. The fruit you bear in your life matters. I mean, it's all significant. And it matters to God. It matters to the devil. Because he can use it when you're not in God in line with God's word. He can use it against you for your detriment. He always comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said in John 10, 10. So this is extremely important. He says, We have in Scripture the most precious assurances of a rest for the soul to be found under the yoke of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's in Matthew. Hopefully we can put that one up too. But So Jesus, when, with the best rest we're going to have is when we're yoked together with Jesus and we're working, you know, that, that was a reference to the oxen that were hooked up to the plow, that were plowing the fields. Why were they plow? Why is why is that relevant here? Because it's plowing the fields, getting it ready for seed, seed to grow up into a harvest. And men's souls is what Jesus came to harvest. He came to harvest them for the kingdom of God. So when we get into the yoke with Jesus, Jesus is right there training us how to live. You know, an oxen, they would take an experienced ox. And they would yoke it with an inexperienced ox so that it could learn how to how to plow a straight line, how to how to obey the uh, the guy behind that's giving him uh, commands. And so Jesus is in the yoke with us to teach us how to walk this life out. And he says it's a peace of God which passes all understanding. It's a peace and a joy in the soul which nothing can take away. Nothing can take your peace and joy away unless you allow it. But nothing, if you don't consent to it, nothing can take it away. But when they are not believed, so when the promises are not believed, they cannot be enjoyed. Faith is in its very nature a resting in the promise and the promiser until he fulfill it in us. Isn't that beautiful? Only faith can enter into rest. So unbelief can't enter into rest. Fear can't enter into rest. But only faith. The fullness of faith enters into the full rest. So the more full you are of faith, and let's just break that down. Faith isn't, it, it, it's, it gets used a lot, even in secular arenas, but it's talking about faithfulness. So when you, when you have a trust in the faithfulness of God, and I'm not saying it means that in every instance, but I would say generally it does. When you, are, when you have um, trust in the faithfulness of God, then your rest will be full. When you have a full trust in, in the faithfulness of God, 
then the rest that you get from that is going to be full too. I think that's wonderful. All right. So he says, today, even as the Holy Ghost saith today. Remember we did a video. If you haven't seen that one, on just the, the title is simply today. That was talking about a warning of today that you've got only today to obey God. And it's much more than that in the video, but that's what he was referring to. Today, even as the Holy Ghost saith today, now and here, we which have believed do enter into rest. So this is, again, a present thing. You can enter into rest today. We're not waiting for when we die and our, and our spirit goes to be with the Lord to enter into the rest. Jesus said that eternity enters your heart as soon as you believe uh, the Father and in Jesus Christ whom he sent. I think that's in John 17. Um, it says, It is with the rest of faith here as with what we heard of being partakers of Christ. The blessing is enjoyed. It is with the rest of faith here as with what we heard of being partakers of Christ. The blessing is enjoyed. So we enjoy it with the rest of faith. And then he, he quotes the scripture, if we hold fast the beginning, our confidence firm unto the end. He says, we may seek by thought and study to enter into the meaning of the promise. God has sworn that we never shall enter into its possession or into his rest, but by faith. The one thing God asks in our intercourse with him and his word is the habit of faith that ever keeps the heart open towards God and longs to enter in and abide in his rest. So the only thing God's asking of us, and it's because it's the first step, it's the entry point, is that we have a habit of faith. We make a lifestyle of faith because it keeps our heart open toward God. If we don't have that, if the door to our heart isn't open through faith, we don't have much going on with God. We're not going to enter and abide in, into his rest. All right. Coming to a close here quickly. Faith is always repose in what another will do for me. See, again, if you put that word faithfulness in there, it makes sense. Faithfulness is always repose, which means rest, in what another will do for me. So you're trusting someone's faithfulness. Faith ceases to seek help in itself or its efforts. Well, you know, in the culture, people are all about, you know, I, I, you know, I can do this myself. I look what I did, pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I'm able to, uh, I did this all my, I'm a self-made man or, you know, I, I am woman, hear me roar kind of thing. But here it says faith ceases to seek help in itself or its efforts. Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And it says its efforts to be troubled with its need or its weakness. So faith ceases to seek help in itself or its efforts to be troubled with its need or its weakness. So faith isn't even troubled with, oh man, I'm so, I, I know I can't do this. I mean, I can't do this by myself. Faith isn't bothered by that. Faith isn't troubled that it's got weaknesses or needs. It rests in the sufficiency of the all-sufficient one who has undertaken all. So you can rest that God's got this. He's, under, he's, he's more than able to get whatever needs to be done. He's more than able to. He's, he says, trust Jesus. Give up and forsake the wilderness. Wow, you would think if you were living in the wilderness for like 40 years, you would think you'd be like, I am ready to get out of this place. I'm ready to go to the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. You know, they'd already had the, um, at some point in the wilderness, they already had the spies go out and they knew it had figs and pomegranates and, and grapes and all of this wonderful produce. They knew that, remember, because that was when the, the people that did actually go into Canaan were still little children because all those people that did not believe God that were over 20 years old, God said, you'll drop in the wilderness. So they've been traveling in the wilderness for a, a while now. And, you know, maybe you've been traveling in your own wilderness. Maybe it's pretty barren and desolate in your relationship with God. But you can leave that place. You don't have to stay there the rest of your life. He says, trust Jesus, give up and forsake the wilderness. Follow him fully. He is the rest. We're not going to have rest apart from following him fully. 
so if you're I would just I would just say this to you if you're still wandering around in a wilderness you might want to check to see how much of your flesh your carnal nature is in charge and how much the Holy Spirit's in charge because I would just I would I'm not, not a betting woman but I would bet that the flesh has sneaked in there and it's taken some possession of your life and your ways and God's wanting, he's wanting your heart. He's wanting you to surrender to him. He says, if you rest content with the thought of having been converted, it may be at the peril of your soul. With Israel, you may perish in the wilderness. So if you're happy, you're, you're like, oh, I can relax. I came out of Egypt. He says, it could be at the peril of your soul. He's talking eternal peril here. God says, I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Ooh, all right. So if God be indeed the fountain of all goodness and blessedness, it follows that the nearer we are to him and the more we have of him, the deeper and the fuller our joy will be. Has not the soul who is not willing at all costs to yield to Christ when he offers to bring us into the rest of God reason to fear? that all its religion is simply the selfishness that seeks escape from punishment and is content with as little of God here as may suffice to secure heaven hereafter. Okay, what he's saying, if you didn't catch all of that is, he's saying, if you're not willing at all costs to surrender to God, to obey him and to yield to him when Christ is offering to bring you into God's rest, if you're not willing to yield to him, then you have reason to fear that all of your religion, your relation, your so-called relationship to God, is simply the selfishness. So your your religion is, I just want enough. I just want to do enough, you know, get my my ticket punched so that I go to heaven and not hell. I mean, if you are just like the very very tiny least bit I have to do to give up my flesh to get to go to heaven, that's what I want to do. Okay, if that's you, and so you're as content as with little of God that can secure heaven for you, he's saying here that you have reason to fear for your soul. You have reason to fear. And I, I hate to think this way, but I suspect that most, and scripturally this is backed up, I suspect that most people in the in the mainstream church are actually in that condition and we just need to be spreading the truth but the first thing we have to do is take a look at our own our own soul and say where am i where's my faith what is my spiritual condition we got to start there and we got to start figuring out where we're at we got to start looking in the mirror of the word and see what it's reflecting back to us I'll just leave you with this. Proverbs 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. That just came to me when I was reading this chapter because when we fear God and we're yielding to God and we're saying, you are the fountain of life. There is no life apart from you. And when we say, you know what? I'm rejecting everything else because I want you. You are life. Then when you have that kind of mentality and your will is set that way, then you're going to depart from the snares of death. You're going to stay far, far away from the edge of the cliff that we just talked about to the peril of your own soul. Like you're going to depart from that. You know, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. So if you see a sign that says the bridge is out ahead, you, you, act on it and you say, okay, I'm going to turn around. But if you don't have the fear of the Lord, then you're going to be so full of your own pride or whatever. You're, that's going to be a snare of death to you that you don't want to obey anything or any, any wisdom. Anyway, I thought I wrote here, this description of God being a fountain like that in Proverbs 14, 27, this description of God being uh, like a fountain reminds me of when I was a kid the uh, the public swimming pool that we went to and also took swimming lessons at um, it was it had this fountain in the middle it was old style um, they don't make swim public swimming uh, 
pools like this anymore. But let me see how I describe it here. Yeah, it was like a beach all the way around and it had a fountain shaped like, it's kind of like a mushroom, a giant mushroom in the middle of the pool. And so when you'd swim out there, you could, it had handles, you could hang on to the fountain because it was over my head. And so that, you know, that I, when I would hang on to that handle, the, the fountain, it was like water was pouring over my head and I was in water over my head. I was completely surrounded by the water. And that just reminds me like God's a fountain of life. That's how we should live our lives, completely surrounded by his life. And the only way we can do that is by heeding his word and yielding to his spirit. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Please uh, like and share this with someone you think will enjoy it. And we'll see you next time.